I'm with Emily Lyons Solberg. Emily is the Vice President of Product Management for IoT or Internet of Things at AT&T Business. Emily, great to see you. Thanks for making time to catch up with me. Thanks for having me. I mean, dying to catch up with you and have a conversation about, of course, Internet of Things or IoT, given your role. Um, I guess I'd like to ask the big question first. Um, it's been predicted that there'll be billions of connected devices in the world of IoT and sensors, smart and dumb sensors and so forth. I'd really love to get your take on how this is making the whole landscape more complex for organizations in the context of the Internet of Things. Right, billions is a lot of devices, yes, right? Indeed. It's a, a, The great thing is that those billions can unlock a lot of value for organizations. Mm -hmm. And there are also projections around trillions of dollars of value being created. But you're right, this is, this is creating new challenges and how do companies unlock that value? Right. And so one of the things that we're seeing that they really need is someone who's got the expertise to walk with them through the journey of what is their business problem? So start mm -hmm. with the business problem rather than the technology. Let the right. business problem then lead to the correct technology for a fit, but it's likely gonna involve sensors and information that then have to travel over a network, that then have to travel into some, some system where they can analyze it, some mm -hmm. system where they can collect the value of it. Uh, and then over into their enterprise systems so that they can actually change their business practices. And that's right. where they really see the value being created. Layer onto that, a lot of these companies really operate globally. Either they are multinationals that have locations around the world or lots of our customers just have a supply chain with goods that are coming in from around the world or customers right. that are located around the world. And they, they're really good at what they do. They manufacture something, they deliver something. They don't have the expertise in things like IoT network connectivity mm -hmm. and devices and sensors. And what they really need is a partner who can bring it all together for them. Indeed. And this is a common thing we're seeing around the world now, particularly in border and so organizations, whether it's transport, logistics, health, education, you name it. They're saying, how do we remain true to our core business? How do we stick to our own knitting, as they say? And how do we find the partners that are going to help us succeed? In that is, it's almost exhausting in many ways because you know they've dealt with cloud, digital transformation, AI, machine learning, big data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and there's so many lanes in which they've got to run. They've got to run them all at the same time. And now along comes the Internet of Things and 5G. It's exhausting for them. You mentioned something that was interesting. I'd like to just come back on. You talked about you know capturing that data from either intelligence or dumb sensors, bringing across the network, which obviously you need to think about things like security, uh, latency, speed, the mm -hmm. volume of the data, and so forth. I, mean, I know when you put a billion devices in something, you go from a couple of megs a day to terabytes a day. Uh, there's a range of those, but uh, a lot of organisations have sensors of various forms now. Certainly in Australia, we've got things like mines, we've got manufacturing plants, we've mm -hmm. got all kinds of interesting things that are big with machines that go hum. Uh, but they haven't had those billions of devices, so they aren't really gearing up for that, that Canberra explosion of infrastructure, the security challenge and the data. And, and also, I guess, you know, the, the information is coming into some system at the moment that's geared for that legacy architecture. They don't necessarily have the capability to deal with the volume of data and the analytics. This must be an interesting challenge you're seeing on a regular basis with people saying, where do we start? Right. Well, so all those billions of devices are now generating information. and. What do customers do with that? So mm -hmm. at AT&T, our network on an average day, we have about 297 uh, petabytes of data. <laughs> which petabytes, <laughs> petabytes. That's right, crazy, oh right? Lord. That's mind-blowing. On a day. And wow. even more crazy is with 5G, the experts are saying that we could get a thousand times increase in that. So the things that customers will be so able to do, we don't even, scale. Yeah, so it's, it's frightening. It's a lot, but, and, and what we often see is in this journey, customers realize that they need to be capturing information. They, they put out sensors. Now they, they now they've got information and it's multiplying and there's more and mm -hmm. more of it and translating the information into an insight and the insight and in, into an action. That's where, yeah. And that's where the trillions of dollars of value that IoT can unlock comes in is when you can really find that action and integrate into some system that may be a legacy business system right. that you have to figure out how to feed this into. And there are things where we even take legacy analog equipment and we're updating it with IoT. So for example, you might have a meter with a dial on it. We're now seeing right. that you know, camera is a sensor in itself. Indeed. So you can have a camera that's trained for when that dial shows a particular reading, it triggers an event and someone goes to do something about it. So I actually, I'm, I'm really fond of that camera example you gave because 
one of the things that uh, in, in one of my lives wearing the, the head of a, a, a data scientist is we've had single sources of data or data streams or access to APIs to pull that data out, and we've only really been able to do one type of treatment to that data. When I think about imagery, particularly streamed images in the form of video, I think about layering that stack, so I can mm -hmm. have sort of the initial wash, to, as you said, has, is the dial moved in the first place? And then the second instance is, like, okay, how far has it moved, in which direction? And you can start to add layers of intelligence, and whether it's machine learning or something more deep, or even just a trigger, uh, and then you can share that data, depending on whether you've got permission. I think this is going to be such a, an exciting change that we can have, you know, just one camera looking at an urban environment. We can see, A, there are people moving. Or do we need security there? There are devices moving. What sort of device? The car. That, to me, just opens up so many more doors for opportunity. But I imagine it also opens up the door for, as you said, complexity and, and potentially then risk, I imagine, that is, well, is it secure? Is it safe? Is someone managing it? Where's the data going? Who's treating that data? Right, and, and customers don't, don't have this expertise. You mentioned video. Video analytics is a really hmm. emerging area for us. We're seeing a lot of development in that space, a lot in the machine learning space. And taking that information and having a video stream, and you start, we, we have a, um, some customers in the connected cooler space, for mm -hmm. example. And when you start thinking about connected coolers, there are probably some things that come to mind that you could do with IoT, like, okay, temperature, all right, um, door open, close information. Yeah, yeah. When you start to look at a particular use case and start applying some of the machine learning and the video and all of the things that our customers want to do, so turns out location's important because sometimes these coolers look so cool that they end up in dorm rooms. Right. Or right. the the owner of the cooler, the brand manufacturer, they've got it in uh, convenience stores around the country and they want to make sure that their brand is what's in the cooler. And so you can do foreign brand detection. You can right. do inventory right. management to That's see when point. do you need to send out the delivery truck yeah. with what uh, with, with what to go in there that's been selling that day, that week, that hour. So all of mm. these things that they, they want to do just with yeah, the yeah. sensors in the cooler, and that's just one device. And the mind and boggles. Then, yeah, and then you start taking that out, and you know things we, we're working with stadiums on perimeter security and queuing, all sorts right. of use cases. So I do like that. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly focused on the humanities component as well because I'm always obsessed with the fact that we're building devices and systems, but we're not uh, necessarily building uh, things around humanities. And at the end of the day, why are we building these systems and these devices is to make our lives better. You touch on something interesting there. As these things, as we get more devices roll out, and certainly when we're talking billions, uh, we, we get more complexity, more connectivity, and that invariably results in more data and more complex data. Mm -hmm. and, and we talk about it in big data, it's like the Vs, you know, veloc and velocity and volume and, and variety and so forth. Um, this must be creating a little bit of a headache initially for your customers, but I'm sure you've solved it yourselves in light of the fact that you're going to go from petabytes to exabytes in, in a very short period of time. Yeah, we've, we've already traveled our learning curve of how to handle that much data, which <laughs> and is <survived>. great. <laughs> and we, uh, we learn as we go with mm, customers, mm. and the best way for, as a product person, to understand what I should be developing next is to talk to customers about business problems. Right. And this is where we identify one customer, work closely with them, and learn a lot as we go. And that's the way we've ended up, we've delivered a lot of what's now the industry standard just by working with our customers on what they really need mm -hmm. and how do we do that through IoT. So. Indeed, well I guess you've got that, that benefit but also the challenge in that as a, as a service provider in, in as a sense, you've not only got to keep up with the technology, you've got to be ahead of it because you've got to be ahead of the curve and they're waiting for the market and the industry to catch up with you. So you've got to learn all those lessons and learn the hard way and, and often it's probably a very expensive investment but it certainly pays off. I know a number of organizations with legacy data sets also seeing those explode and that is that you know, we've got, as I said, you know, mining organizations might have had 40 sensors for some reason and mm -hmm. big piece of machinery. Now they're thinking about 40,000 or 40 mm -hmm. million as it might mm -hmm. be. And eventually billions, they, they're looking at a scenario where in the next 12 to 18 months they're going to create more data than they've created for the entire lifetime of the organization to sometimes you know, magnitudes of two or three times. Uh, and, and they don't necessarily have the resourcing for that, the funding, the infrastructure, the capability. And again, that brings that back to what you said before, finding the right partner and the right relationships such as AT&T Business to, and the AT&T Network to help them solve that because that's not their core business. They might be a mine. That's exactly right. And we look at each customer and we look at how, how do we simplify things for them and some of the solutions we come up with are around how do we solve for the fact that there's all of this data because you have to think about where's the right place mm. for compute mm. and where's the right place for storage and then there, there's the integration back into the enterprise systems with the so what of the data. But yeah. as we look at things like our edge compute, we've got a network edge compute and we've got an on-premise multi-access mm -hmm. edge compute. 
That helps move the compute into different places depending on what the customer's needs are, what kind of latency they're looking for, how to really solve that problem. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that's something where if you, if that's not your core business, if you're not good at running a telco network, not good at running uh, multi-edge right. compute, if you're not good at running the, the, the edge compute clustering and, and designing applications and the data movement, then that could really be a major pitfall if you get it wrong because sometimes there's some big sunk costs on that. Um, when you're looking at this whole space of implementing IoT solutions, and you know, some people want to leap at this thing and throw millions of things out there, some people want to take it slowly, um, where are some of the biggest challenges that these organizations are going to face? And, and, and I guess first let's start across all industries. When we deploy these things, we've got some physical infrastructure, we've got security infrastructure, we've got connectivity, we've got data. Where are you seeing some of the biggest challenges being faced with some of the early adopters that you're working with? Well, probably the single biggest thing that's on our customers' minds when they start a conversation around IoT is security, making sure that right. they're not going to be in the news with an issue. <laughs> no and one wants to be on the front page. <laughs> no one <right>? does. <laughs> and there, there, has, there have been stories about there IoT devices out there. So one of the things that AT&T brings to the table is very sophisticated, very mature security around mm -hmm. IoT. Mm -hmm. We encrypt everything, we have security from the information on the device as it travels through the network and as it travels into an application. We've got security at each of these steps. We've also got the information where we can do trend detection on the network itself and anticipate when there's an issue that our customer right. needs to know about. And so using these assets, that's, that's one of the things that get, gets customers past this barrier of concern about security. Mm -hmm. And then once they get there, there are a variety of other operational challenges that, like you said, they're really good at doing the thing that they've been doing, for many cases, decades mm -hmm. or even hundreds mm -hmm. of years. That's their expertise. Our job is to make it simple so that they don't have to think about the complexity of things like RF engineering for networks. Indeed. And you know, a lot of organizations think about this as a point in time check in the box. You know, they do ISO 9000 compliance for standards, they do ISO 27001 and 2 for security, and they think, cool, we've got a tick in the box. And then 9 o'clock the next morning comes along and things have changed. Someone's put new sensors in place, or project directors have rolled things out they didn't document, or the security team just didn't notify. So I think, in many ways, what you're saying is that as this evolves, we've got to continually stay ahead of those changes and evolutions prior, not afterwards, because I don't think security is an, an afterthought in any case uh, in a no. successful story. Um, when we think about where we're at now, I mean, 2019 has sort of been the lead up to the, uh, I guess, you know, not just the, the announcement and release of 5G, but now it's the adoption and, and integration. 2020 or 2020, as you say here, is going to really be the year of 5G in my mind. And I'm, I should probably print some t-shirts for that. Um, <laughs> but again, this is another big shift in the landscape for Internet of Things because now we've got, as you said, many more devices. We're not, not limited to like 250 odd by Wi-Fi. We've got tens of thousands in access points, uh, eventually billions. Again, we've got another sort of shifting sands environment where just when we thought we had a grasp on it with 4G, 5G comes along and everything puts some a few zeros on it. Uh, what are you hearing out on the street, as it were, with your clients as to some of their concerns and, and some of the things that they need to be thinking about as to how they're going to deal with the Internet of Things challenge as 5G is introduced into this mix? One of the really interesting things about 5G, which is different from the other Gs that have come along, 2G, 3G, 4G, mm. those have been really about throughput advancements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the great things about 5G is that part of what the standard was addressing was that millions and billions of connected devices. Part of it is around, it's called massive IoT. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's available now. There were purpose-built IoT networks out of the cellular standards that were created and that AT&T has launched. We've launched LTEM and narrowband Indeed. IoT. And we've got roaming agreements. We've got more advanced roaming than anyone else in terms of all of the other operators in the world who mm. have launched these mm. networks so that our customers who are seeking global coverage can get it. So that's, that's part of what today is for IoT right. when I think 5G. Well, 5G is an interesting challenge because you know, 3GPP are really up to, up to sort of release 17 of a still technically a draft, right? And as we go through the tiers, we've got next generation radio, that's finished. We're going through, I guess, the, the controls and security, that's nearly finished. But it's still a, an evolving thing. So often people forget that 5G isn't actually a 1.0 release yet. We're just building as that stack grows. So a lot of these things that are being deployed, organizations are even mm -hmm. challenged when they realize 
it's not a finished standard, right? How do I work with this? But we have to do this because otherwise, you know, we're just going to sit on our hands and wait and do nothing, right? And I guess that goes back to some of that uh, evolutionary journey you're talking about, and that is that we've still got to think about the long term and where we're going to be as far as the outcome goes. But we've, we've, today is here, and we've got to plan for it, be ready for it. Um, the other thing I'm interested in is uh, the, the use cases where Internet of Things sensors and data collections coming about. When we think about IoT, often the industrial Internet of Things is the first one that comes to mind because we've had sensors out in manufacturing plants, robotics, mines and mm -hmm, so forth, big mm -hmm, ships, aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that there's a, a real consumer opportunity now in not so much the mobile phone devices, but in retail and, and, and soft that we're facing ourselves, uh, particularly autonomous vehicles and, mm -hmm, and all these other right. systems, hospitals. Um, is that a shift we're seeing now from sort of the pure industrial to now humanities and people facing things where consumers are facing the IoT themselves as opposed to just big machines that go hum? Well, we've, we've had consumer facing IoT devices already. So if you think of like a Nest thermostat, that's okay. and even if you go back, go back before we were even calling it IoT, things mm. like your garage door opener. That's true. That's yeah. a connected thing. So. The great thing about 5G is even beyond the massive IoT and the um, kind of purpose-built IoT networks, you do start to tap into these new capabilities that come with super high throughput and super right. low latency. And that has implications on both the enterprise and the consumer side. So the enterprise side, if you think about things like a video camera that can now stream high quality mm -hmm. video on a super fast network, that's powerful. And then you think about some of these ultra low latency mm. use cases, like you can do remote things. You, know, you mentioned mining, mm. anything with latency sensitivity, like utilities, anything where I'm doing something like remote surgery, yeah. I'm remote controlling something, autonomous vehicles. This I love is the all haptic where... feedback gloves, for example. I saw yeah. recently, I think it was uh, College of London of Medicine, or the London College of Medicine, I should say, uh, did an experiment, I think it might have been with you, and they had haptic gloves over 5G where the surgeon was somewhere centrally because they, they brought all the broken people to them. Uh, ambulances out in the field were doing high resolution scans, sending that data That's to the right. people, and they were like, well, let me have a feel around. And that haptic feedback was telling the surgeon whether the bullet was at the surface or internally, and they could gear up at the surgery for the type of triage and the type of special it had. And I was like, wow, the, the, these arms are reaching all the way over 5G into the van, seeing how I am. And that, that blew my mind, because I was like, okay, what else can we do? You know, I was That's sort of right. thinking about a virtual hug, actually, but you know. Yeah, well, it makes <laughs> uh, you think of the potential. such a different yeah. use case I would not have thought of, but then it's mm -hmm. almost like George Jetson's sci-fi, but it's mm -hmm. here today. That's right. And, you know, all of these things, and you know, that that's one with medicine, but we see it on factory floors yeah. and this ability to be remote, but instantly be able to control machinery that, you know, milliseconds matter, so. You must literally jump out of bed to come and do your job every day, I imagine, it's, it's so exciting. It's so cool, but uh, the great thing is I, I don't know what the future will hold. Jeff yeah. McElfish, our CEO, used the word canvas the other day. The tools right. that we're giving our customers are like a canvas, right. and so, I don't know what we'll do with all of this fantastic throughput and low latency and the billions of devices and all of this data. You know, I think w we, we can only just imagine the beginnings of it, but what the next 10 years brings, that's going to be so exciting. It's almost breathtaking. Well, I love that uh, canvas analogy because it almost allows both us and the consumers to paint their own story. And, and in many ways, as AT&T businesses, you're just going to be ready with a palette to help them, right? That's right. Well, Emily, it's been fantastic to see you. Thank you so much for making time for me. And I, I love the anecdotes you shared and the insights. And I, I almost want to apply for a job in your department because IoT is so damn Come exciting. on, it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And I look forward to catching up again soon and seeing what you've been doing the next three to six months. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.